Minutes to midnight on the 30th of June, 1997. In the Hong Kong Convention and Exhibition Center, Wan Chai, one flag is lowered and another is raised. After a 99-year lease, the rule of Hong Kong is returned to the People's Republic of China from Britain. This is Megan Schaefer with the Oxford Comment. The 1st of July 2022 marks the 25th anniversary of the handover of Hong Kong. It also marks the halfway point of a 50-year agreement between China and Hong Kong that established the one country, two systems rule, a system designed to allow Hong Kong to enjoy a high degree of autonomy, except in foreign and defense affairs, while remaining a special administrative region of China. In recent years, civil unrest in Hong Kong has intensified as groups of protesters, police, and politicians have clashed over issues of democracy and state influence, leading many to question just how much the one country, two systems rule still applies. On today's episode, we are delighted to be joined by leading experts in Chinese history and foreign policy, Professor Jeffrey N. Wasserstrom, editor of the Oxford History of Modern China, and Dr. Tim Rulig, author of China's Foreign Policy Contradictions, Lessons from China's R2P, Hong Kong, and WTO Policy, who explore the history, handover, and future of Hong Kong, what led us here, the key moments, and what lessons can be learned. Today, we welcome Jeffrey Wasserstrom. He is the Chancellor's Professor of History at the University of California, Irvine. He has written, co-written, edited, and co-edited a dozen books. His most recent ones are, as author, uh, Vigil, Hong Kong on the Brink, and as co-author, the third edition of China in the 21st Century, What Everyone Needs to Know. In addition to writing for scholarly periodicals, he often contributes to newspapers and magazines. Uh, welcome, Jeffrey. Good to be here. We are happy to have you. So I'm going to jump right into our questions. Uh, first and foremost, could you provide us with the historical context for the involvement of the British and Chinese that led to changes in Hong Kong's governance? So the place for a historian to begin the story of modern Hong Kong, though Hong Kong goes back before this period um, and has an interesting uh, local history that can go, go back for centuries before the area there. The place to start is really with the Opium War, um, the clash between the British and Qing empires that ended with Britain defeating uh, the Qing. And in the settlement of that war, Hong Kong Island was ceded uh, to the British as a colony. Uh, one interesting thing about it was at the time, some people on both sides were displeased about that uh, decision. Uh, from the Qing empire's point of view, to cede any land in perpetuity to uh, another empire was seen as uh, giving up too much. But Lord Palmerston, the foreign secretary of the British at that point felt that getting Hong Kong Island was getting too little. And he made a statement that uh, is one of the first of many forecasts about Hong Kong that made fools of forecasters because he said, that to get Hong Kong was, was not enough because it was, in his words, a barren hill with barely a house upon it. He exaggerated. And it would never be a great mart of trade, by which he meant that it would never be as major a center as uh, Macau nearby that had been a Portuguese colony for a long time, or Canton nearby that was the main South China port through which uh, trade between the Qing and the West was, was rooted. And of course, over time, Hong Kong, which always had the advantages of a marvelous harbor, grew to be a great mart of trade indeed, and in many ways surpassed its neighbors by the end of the 19th century. So that's, that's where the kind of story of modern Hong Kong, as I say, there's, there's more to it than that um, going back, but that's where what Hong Kong as an international city. That's where the story really begins. And it goes through all sorts of important phases after that, but I would just highlight two moments in particular as we're thinking about the history of the city going forward. And one of those uh, moments is in 1860, at the end of another war between the Qing Empire and this time both the British Empire and the French, at the end of that second Opium War, uh, the British get additional lands Kowloon, uh, on Kowloon Peninsula as part of the colony of Hong Kong. 
And then years later in 1898, additional territory, a whole set of nearby villages and other, um, and other land that became known as the new territories becomes part of British Hong Kong. But importantly, those territories are not ceded to Britain in perpetuity as a colony, but rather there's a 99 year lease for them. So there's an expiration date on this arrangement of 1997. And that looms over Hong Kong and the British and Chinese feelings about Hong Kong because there's a sense that in 1997, uh, things have to change and the new territories need to go under Chinese control. And so that's why 1997 was seen as a potential turning point for a long time. What were some of the resultant changes that came from this handover? So when the handover itself takes place in 1997, it's not just the new territories that are transferred uh, to Chinese control, but all of Hong Kong, including the, the parts that were a British colony. One of the issues was that while technically the British could have maintained control over Hong Kong Island and Kowloon um, Peninsula, a lot of the food that Hong Kongers uh, relied upon, a lot of the energy and the water, all of that was in the new territory. So the decision was made in the 1980s that all of Hong Kong would be transferred to Chinese control, which at that point meant becoming part of the People's Republic of China. And a complicated arrangement was worked out um, between negotiators in London and Beijing. And it's important that Hong Kongers themselves were largely left out of that negotiation or were brought into it, but never were able to set the terms of it. It was, in a sense, transferring uh, control of the territory from Britain uh, to, to China. Uh, but there were things set in place that would, would modify the situation. And the idea was that there would be a system that was referred to as one country, two systems. And what that meant was that Hong Kong would become part of the People's Republic of China, but for 50 years going forward from 1997 until 2047, uh, it would operate in a distinctive fashion uh, that would make it a different kind of place than other cities that were part of the PRC. And under that arrangement, for example, there would be a continuity of um, a different kind of economic system that was in place in Hong Kong. And, but beyond the economic system staying different, there was a kind of push and pull from the beginning before 1997 and after 1997 over what else counted as the two systems. What else would be different in Hong Kong besides the way people made and spent money? Uh, in Beijing, the Chinese Communist Party largely wanted from the beginning that to be the main thing that stayed different. But there were things that were, that were put into the agreement known as the basic law that spelled out how things would happen. That was the kind of closest thing to a constitution that, that Hong Kong has ever had. Um, under the basic law, the idea was that over time, Hong Kong people would govern Hong Kong. And that, could, that was understood in different ways. Um, there were elections for members of a legislative council that was established before 1997 and then was refined after 1997. And under that system, some seats were open to a, a, an open election and others were arranged so that it would be likely or definite that pro-Beijing candidates would, would have those, those spots. But there was some form of democracy. Uh, a bit of this came in at the late period of colonial rule and that it continued after 1997 before going back into Hong Kong's past as a colony there were a lot of periods where there was really no degree of democracy and the uh, main official was appointed um, by London. So the idea that after 1997, Hong Kong people would themselves uh, begin to govern Hong Kong was something that was very important to people uh, locally. And a lot of the story after 1997 was 
Hong Kong people trying to expand the degree of democracy, including moving toward open elections for who the chief executive in Hong Kong would be, while Beijing tried to make it so that the chief executive in Hong Kong would have to be someone who was amenable to uh, Beijing's uh, view of how things should be done. And so there were elections for chief executive, which were a new thing after 1997, but they weren't free and open elections because the only candidates that could run in that election were ones that were decided upon by fewer than 2,000 people in a city of millions who had the right to um, figure out who would be able to stand. And the only people able to stand were people that had been vetted in some ways um, by Beijing. So you had something in which under one country, two systems, there were some elements of um, democratic forms coming in, but in a constrained way. There were some other things that continued from the period of British colonial rule that were important to local people, such as a different legal system, a different system of independent courts that were very different from what took place on the mainland. Um, there was a freer press. That was something that was also um, very important. In the lead up to 1997, some people thought that as soon as Hong Kong became part of the People's Republic of China, all of those things that made it, it different beyond the kind of economic system would immediately disappear. And those pessimistic predictions became a new example of Hong Kong making fools of forecasters, because in fact, early on, uh, Beijing exerted a fairly light hand over Hong Kong in many ways. And the courts that operated very different, differently than on the mainland, um, defendants had a much better chance of um, being declared innocent uh, after a trial than they did on the mainland, where there was often about a 99% conviction rate in Hong Kong, judges could, could rule that the police had acted inappropriately in a, in a situation, something that didn't happen on the mainland. In Hong Kong, there was much more freedom of assembly, much more vibrant civil society than there was on the mainland. So initially it seemed that the one country, two systems framework uh, might really be quite meaningful that the one country part would be that Hong Kong would not have its own diplomacy. It would not have its own military. Though in, in diplomatic and military terms, it would be part of the country, the People's Republic of China. But in many ways that not just business, but also the press, universities, the courts, the way they operated, it would be very different from cities just over the border in the mainland. Um, nearby Macau, which became part of the People's Republic of China in 1999, when the Portuguese uh, ceded control of it, it also had a one country, two systems framework. And so these two former colonies stood apart from mainland cities, but Macau never had as vibrant a sort of sense of political freedoms and uh, freedoms of speech and assembly as there were in Hong Kong. So in a sense, there was a way in which at Macau, the, in Macau over time, one country, two systems really just meant Macau was a lot like uh, mainland cities with some, some greater freedoms. But in many ways, the main part of the thing that made two systems relevant for Macau was that there was a different, different rules about how people made and spent money, most obviously, with things like casinos and gambling there that could not be on the mainland. And so there was a push and pull where Beijing, I think from quite early on, though it exerted a light touch over Hong Kong, you could tell that the Chinese Communist Party's hope was that over time, there would be less and less that made Hong Kong stand apart from mainland cities, while people in Hong Kong pushed for more and more to help it uh, stand apart. What does the one country, two systems model mean for Hong Kong today in 2022, politically, socially, and economically? So the story of Hong Kong in the last couple of decades, I think, has been one in which a period when it seemed that Beijing was exerting a fairly light hold on the, the territory has shifted to one where Beijing has been trying to exert 
a tighter and tighter control and working through its proxies in the city to try to minimize the kind of meaningfulness of the two systems part of one country, two systems. While there have also been in recent years, a series of dramatic protests, uh, particularly in the 2010s, though there were protests before then that were important as well, that were about either trying to expand and strengthen uh, the separateness of Hong Kong uh, in political terms, such as by fighting unsuccessfully in the end for free and open uh, democratic elections for chief executive, or the protests were about pushing back against what were seen as moves to curtail freedoms that existed already within Hong Kong. And so you had a series of protests, some successful and many, at least in terms of their specific goals, unsuccessful over this kind of tussle over one country, two systems. In 2012, there were important protests that succeeded to push back against an encroachment on the sort of separateness of Hong Kong, which was, these were protests against bringing mainland style patriotic education into the city and teenagers supported by um, some other members of society pushed back against this. Um, for example, one of the things that made Hong Kong education different was that in Hong Kong, you could teach about the Tiananmen protests of 1989 and the brutal June 4th massacre that, that suppressed them. On the mainland, you couldn't. In 2012, it looked as though the local authorities were going to bring in mainland style education on topics like that. Youth activists, including young people who became uh, famous within the territory and later uh, globally like Joshua Wong and Agnes Chow at that point um, in secondary school uh, spearheaded a move against that and the government um, blinked and tabled that and, put, and, and pulled back on that. In 2014, there was a more famous um, and substantial movement that became known as either Occupy Central or the Umbrella Movement in which the, the demand was for uh, free and open elections for chief executive. And the movement failed to achieve that, but it did achieve um, a considerable amount in terms of showing how people could mobilize when they cared about something. And there was um, a 79 day period when uh, Hong Kong was largely paralyzed by the protests in the central district and Occupy districts in other parts of um, the city as well. Um, it demonstrated how passionate uh, members of civil society could be in trying to protect things they valued because the movement, while it began as a movement for increased democracy, became quite quickly a movement for the right to protest itself, to defend the right to protest itself, and to push back against uh, what was seen as overreaching by the police and inappropriately strong tactics against the protesters when pepper spray and um, tear gas was used against protesters who were engaged in largely nonviolent forms of civil disobedience or forms where the only kind of violence was uh, to objects and buildings, not to people. So that movement was crushed. And after it, there were a variety of further moves that were seen by local people as trying to mainlandize Hong Kong to minimize the differences between uh, the city. One of those important moves was the kidnapping of um, five booksellers who were involved with publishing the kinds of books in Hong Kong that could not be published on the mainland. And the, the kind of greater freedom of publication was another thing that people valued as making Hong Kong uh, stand apart. And so when these booksellers were uh, disappeared and showed up on the mainland, in some cases making what were quite clearly forced confessions on television, uh, this was seen as a, a warning sign to Hong Kong people that an erosion or destruction of the two systems part of one country, two systems was underway. And there were protests uh, against that. There were protests also when there were moves by the mainland to interfere with um, legislative council um, elections, trying to get people disqualified um, who had been elected to the council 
but were seen as not having taken their oath of office with enough respect. These kinds of things happened between um, the end of the umbrella movement at the end of 2014 and 2019. And there were sporadic protests. There were more moves in this direction. There was a sense of things reaching a period of crisis. Uh, and it was unclear whether Hong Kong people would rise again to push back against those and how the state would, how the authorities would respond if they did. And those questions were answered in 2019 when the largest sustained uh, protest in any part of the People's Republic of China uh, since 1989 took place in Hong Kong and then ended after a very dramatic series of events back and forth ended with the protests um, being crushed. Um, and those protests, it's important to, 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 to realize that they began as a push back against an erosion of, um, of local liberties. They began when the local authorities proposed a, um, an extradition bill. The extradition bill would have allowed people in Hong Kong who who the mainland wanted to try on the mainland to be taken over the mainland to be tried in that very different kind of legal system. And um, this was seen by local people as essentially being um, a, a law that if it went into to practice would be the end of the rule of law in Hong Kong because even though the initial case that was used to justify it was one of a murder case, the fear was that um, if it went into effect, then anybody who was seen by the mainland authorities of speaking out in ways that really angered the Chinese Communist Party could be taken across the border into a system in which they would not have the kind of legal protections that people in Hong Kong uh, valued for themselves. So there were protests that started as a pushback against this um, proposed extradition bill, but very quickly became uh, a movement to protect the, the right to protest itself became a kind of protest that kept going because people felt that the police had um, gotten out of hand in the way they were trying to crush the protests. Uh, so one of the main calls of the protesters and one, the one that I think kept the movement going uh, the longest when, it, when the local authorities refused to give a, to budge on it was that there should be an independent investigation of police uh, violence against protesters. Um, it's important to realize that there was some violence by protesters as well as violence by the police during uh, 2019 protests that evolved into, uh, that went from being marches of, of unprecedented size um, for Hong Kong uh, by estimates. Uh, some marches drew over a million people to the streets of a city that has 7.5 million or so. And that's just a staggering percentage of the population to turn out in any kind of setting. It ended up developing into pitched battles at points between um, protesters who some of uh, a very small percentage of whom, but some of whom drew Molotov cocktails and engaged in actions like that. But the police, uh, for their part, used unprecedented amounts of tear gas against protesters, including using tear gas in the kinds of settings where um, it's, it's universally agreed that tear gas shouldn't be used, such as inside enclosed spaces, such as uh, subway stations. So over time, what began as an exclusively nonviolent movement evolved um, into one in which there was, um, there was violence on both sides. But even once there was a great deal of violence on both sides, uh, public opinion show, polls showed, as well as the people who showed their feelings by taking to the streets, showed that the majority of Hong Kongers continued to believe that the preponderance of violence was coming from the side of the police rather than the protesters. And um, the movement kept, kept going longer than anybody expected early on it would and grew larger uh, than anyone early on expected it would and became this kind of final struggle over the fate of uh, one country, two systems as it had operated and as uh, people in Hong Kong, many people in Hong Kong wanted it to operate. Uh, but at the end of 2019, while there were the last big protests late in 2019 
and a large march on um, New Year's Day 2020. But after that, the Hong Kong story really went into a different kind of phase when um, repression of the movement uh, continued and the space for continued protest uh, began to disappear and the kind of space to organize in civil society uh, for future actions also um, began to disappear. And under, um, under the cover in part of uh, COVID-19, which both allowed laws to come in, uh, regulations to come in as they came in in many places that limited mass gatherings, uh, but also provided uh, just a global distraction that allowed the authorities in Beijing to do something that they had probably wanted to do for quite some time, which is introduce a new national security law um, imposed on Hong Kong, even though one stipulation of the basic law against sedition and things like that should be developed and implemented by uh, the Hong Kong authorities, not imposed from outside, um, the Beijing authorities violated that part of the, the basic law uh, by imposing a very stringent national security law on the territory that went into effect July 1st of 2020 and immediately had a profound chilling effect on, on local people because under this new law, there was the potential for um, people that were seen as violating it and a lot of the terms of it were left fairly vague to risk um, being sentenced to life imprisonment. And after that, a new, um, a new national security law enforcement apparatus developed that's a kind of mainland style police structure within Hong Kong uh, has developed. And so um, there have been a series of, um, of blows to local, uh, local society hitting different segments of society at different times, but having the overall effect of um, making people fear that doing a lot of things that would have been routine to be able to do in Hong Kong, such as organize uh, protests or speak out against the authorities in a public venue, could now come with a kind of um, harsh penalties on them that uh, had been routine on the mainland, but had not been the case in Hong Kong. So the last couple of years have just been a devastating series of moves um, in which many of the things that made Hong Kong stand apart have been disappearing. Uh, there no longer is the same kind of protections of rule of law and uh, ability to, to know that you're going to have um, a fair trial. There has been the shuttering of newspapers that were published and um, published the kind of material that was banned on the mainland. Um, there's been the introduction of patriotic edu education into the schools. In a sense, all the things that people were fearing before uh, 2019 and that helped motivate them uh, to take to the streets have come in blow after blow after blow to the city. What do you think will happen after 2047, the date after which mainland China is no longer obliged to grant the autonomy agreed upon with Britain prior to the handover? In a sense, while that was a question that was very relevant to ask at an earlier point, in some ways it's become a moot point because the idea was that until 2047, there would be this one country, two system framework that had Hong Kong remain quite different and then things would change in 2047 and how things would change was an open question. But now that's not really the question because the two systems part of one country, two systems has really been gutted it, in ways other than how people make and spend money. Very little continues uh, from that earlier framework. So two things that Hong Kongers have um, sometimes said about this, I think are worth uh, repeating. One was an idea that one country, two systems became over time, one country, 1.9 systems, then 1.8 systems, then 1.7 systems. And now for all intents and purposes, is really just one country, one system. But the other thing that's been said, and I, I'm not sure um, this was originally on social media, and I learned about it from um, reading something by Joanna Chiu, who's um, uh, a Hong Konger um, journalist now in um, 
Canada. But she said on social media, some um, young Hong Kongers were saying in the early 2020s, uh, boy, I thought I would be older when 2047 arrived. Meaning that by their feeling is they thought, you know, that, that until their, um, they would be in their 40s, but, but 2047 by all intents and purposes had arrived when they were still in, in their 20s. So there is a sense in which um, one way that a lot of people feel in Hong Kong is that things that they worried about taking place over a long period of time have happened very quickly. Um, there was a, an important movie made in Hong Kong in 2015 called 10 Years in which a group of directors imagined in quite dystopian terms uh, what Hong Kong would be like in 2025, uh, 10 years down the road, if trends that were underway that they were worried about continued. And yet, when people talk about that film, a lot of people said when it came out, uh, and this was a film, by the way, that of course was, um, was anathema to the Chinese Communist Party and, was, um, and has been banned and all kinds of things. But people said in 2015, when it came out, that it was a scary movie that seemed like it might be predicting uh, a dark future that would be there by the mid 2020s. But by the time the national security law was enforced, a lot of people were saying that actually the predictions in it were arriving much, um, much faster than even that film that had seemed so dystopian and futuristic had predicted. So I think one of the interesting things in, in watching um, Hong Kong change from afar and reading um, what people in Hong Kong are, are, have been saying, and, and I think it's important to say that people in Hong Kong have still been trying to make use of whatever space remains to express their outrage or their concern or their despair via, uh, and sometimes via the kinds of techniques that people living under a harsh form of repression and censorship need to in kind of indirect ways and through artistic and creative uh, expression. So the sort of spirit of resistance in Hong Kong really um, is still there. It's just been forced to go underground. But what one thing that a lot of people within Hong Kong experiencing uh, what's been going on have been said is it's, it's shocking how fast um, blows have been coming to the things they treasured about Hong Kong. One of the Hong Kong journalists I find um, most insightful to read, Mary Hui, uh, wrote about changes coming at warp speed uh, after the national security law came in. But I think it's important to realize that from an outside perspective, in some ways, the Chinese Communist Party has very cleverly moved um, slowly in bringing about the changes they want to see in Hong Kong in the sense of making sure that the moves they make uh, take place in different news cycles so that the kind of global outrage that there might have been over this kind of sense that 2047 was being forced in, in uh, on the city in, in 2020 isn't fully appreciated uh, by people trying to navigate um, in this very strange world we've been living of crisis after crisis globally and a short attention span uh, about global news. So that, for example, after the national security law came in, it wasn't that every famous dissident was immediately arrested. Some were arrested uh, quite quickly and others um, more slowly. It wasn't that every civil society group was threatened. Those in some segments of society were threatened in one month or even one year and others in another. Um, there was a dramatic move against uh, the highest profile publisher of a newspaper in, um, in Hong Kong, uh, Jimmy Lai, with um, a large contingent of police raiding the newspaper offices of, of Apple Daily. That happened and then it took another year before um, after he was removed from the scene for another symbol of Hong Kong's difference, uh, two other symbols of Hong Kong's difference, famous statues uh, commemorating Tiananmen that couldn't be um, anywhere on the mainland but could be on Hong Kong campuses. It took, a, it took almost a year after Jimmy Lai's arrest uh, for 
uh, those statues to be taken down from Hong Kong University, where the Pillar of Shame statue was, and Chinese University of Hong Kong, where the Goddess of Democracy statue was. Um, those disappeared in a completely different news cycle, sort of as the world had had time to think about other things. And, and in between, there were a variety of moves against um, specific kind of other, other symbols and people associated with Hong Kong's difference. So you have in one sense, this very fast, or it can seem very fast, move to curtail Hong Kong's freedoms um, after, uh, after the 2019 uh, protests ended, but in another way, it's taken um, a couple of years for the, those kinds of uh, repressive moves to fully take hold. And that has allowed them to both take place in the open view of the world and remain to some extent under the radar. And there was in a sense, a false expectation in some of the global media um, in 2019 that the end of Hong Kong's freedoms would happen in a manner somehow similar to what had happened uh, in Beijing in 1989, when tanks rolled in and soldiers um, came in and there were dead bodies on the street. And somehow that expectation meant that anything subtler than that, anything else seemed lesser or seemed not to be something that, that the world really needed to sit up and pay attention to. So what some analysts of this have talked about what's happened since, um, Louisa Lim and Graham Smith wrote, for example, about the Tiananmen playbook being used in Hong Kong, even if the Tiananmen moment of the June 4th massacre wasn't replicated there. And I wrote about this in Nikkei Asia as saying that the crackdown on Hong Kong was Tiananmen without the massacre. That all of the other kinds of things, the kind of gutting of civil society, the installation of fear, um, and even the kind of effort to tell a narrative about um, the place's recent past that was based on fundamental distortions of what has taken place. All of that has, has happened, even though there wasn't the single moment uh, to seize on. So in fact, what you've had, um, if we think about parallels to the stifling of, of freedoms in Hong Kong, we might think about other parallels um, in, in other parts of the world, but even in, in the PRC itself, when um, something more less instantaneous than the June 4th, 1989 moment in Beijing took place, there are precedents. Um, one precedent is that when the city of Shanghai um, was taken over by the Chinese Communist Party in 1949, um, Shanghai, which had played a role very like Hong Kong as a kind of uh, gateway city between China and, and the wider world. Before then, um, people in Shanghai were told, look, even though you'll be part of a Communist Party run state, a lot of local activities that you're used to can go on much as they have been. Businesses, we'll, we'll have a light touch on businesses. Uh, there were even some newspapers that continued. And there was an idea that Shanghai would be able to remain a kind of separate sort of uh, cosmopolitan city that was brought into the country um, and would be part of this new country, but would be able to be quite different. And people in Shanghai in 1949 and 1950, some of them left feeling there was no way that this would actually be the case, but others, including sometimes people of the same in the same family, decided to stick it out and see what it was like, even if they were part of the one or another social group, intellectuals, journalists, business people that were likely to find it harder under Communist Party rule. They stayed for a while. And then it was only in 1950, 51, 52, that it became clear that the city was going to have to be in many ways, much like any other Chinese city that the people left. So that would be a lot of the similar kinds of debates with uh, over whether to stay or whether to leave. Um, there were echoes that I think of that kind of Shanghai moment in Hong Kong recently. And the other place to think about is Tibet, which in the early 1950s was told that something, the term one country, two systems wasn't used, but a 17 point agreement was made 
that made promises similar to the one country, two systems thing. The idea was that people in Tibet would be able to enjoy a quite different uh, lifestyle. And for a time, uh, people in Tibet, including even the Dalai Lama thought that could work. But by the end of the 1950s, it became clear um, that it wasn't going to work. There was resistance and then there was repression. And then Tibet became not just another part of the PRC, but one of the most intensely repressed and controlled parts of it. So I think thinking about Hong Kong now, rather than looking forward to what will happen in 1947, uh, it can be as valuable to look backward and say, how is what's happened so far um, paralleled in some quite disturbing, deeply disturbing ways, what happened to Shanghai in an earlier period and what happened in Tibet in an earlier period as well. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jeff, and thank you for sharing with us your insight into both Hong Kong's history and present day situation. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about something that I care about so deeply. Our next guest is author Tim Brulig. Tim Brulig is a research fellow at the German Council on Foreign Relations and an associate fellow with the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. His current projects focus on China's domestic determinants of Chinese foreign policy making, China's growing footprint in technical standardization, the emerging US-China technology rivalry, and its implications for Europe. In addition to his academic research, Rulig provides policy advice to European policymakers, such as the European Commission. He chairs the working group High Technology and Innovation of the EU-funded Cost Action Europe in China Research Network and is a member of the European Think Tank Network on China, which he coordinated in 2018. Thank you for joining us today, Tim. My pleasure. Thank you. What does Hong Kong's current status tell us about Chinese foreign policy within these past 50 years? You know, I think the Hong Kong affairs really tells us that China has been always extremely pragmatic, pragmatic about foreign policy in the light of its domestic situation and also its international strength. Just let's think back 50 years when the British for the very first time came to the Chinese then paramount leader, Deng Xiaoping, and try to talk about him with the hand back, with handing over um, Hong Kong back to China. The British at first said that they would like to extend a lease. They had uh, a lease uh, contract with China for 99 years following the Opium Wars. And the, and the British uh, saw that 10 years later, this would come to an end. Uh, and they thought that it would be good to actually start negotiating the future of Hong Kong for the sake of providing um, predictability for investors going to Hong Kong. And the Chinese were absolutely not prepared. So everything that Deng Xiaoping said that uh, the British should tell investors that they could put their heart at ease, uh, which is really nothing. He was not prepared. He didn't understand international law. The Chinese were entirely unprepared for this. A few years earlier, even, the, the Portuguese had approached them about Macau and offered to hand back Macau to the Chinese, and the Chinese even refused that because they simply saw sort of the benefit uh, of those parts that were sort of, that they claimed were still uh, Chinese, but at the same time were under colonial rule, which provided quite also some benefit to the Chinese economically. And from there, I think you could see that in the 80s, in the mid 80s, when the Sino British Joint Declaration was negotiated, you could see the Chinese wanted to keep it as vague as possible. The, the whole drafting uh, process was really back and forth. The British wanted to have a very detailed negotiation and a very detailed contract, while the Chinese wanted to keep it as loose and, and open for interpretation as possible because they wanted to keep as much pragmatic room for maneuver as possible. So pragmatism also was very present during the final stages of negotiating the Sino-British Joint Declaration. When Deng Xiaoping and Margaret Thatcher met in 84, 1984, it became very clear that Thatcher uh, wanted to know sort of 
what would happen after the 50 years uh, that were promised to Hong Kong as being a special administrative region with a high degree of autonomy, when Deng Xiaoping essentially responded, well, if China needed more than 50 years to adapt to Hong Kong, it would give it more years. And I mean, compare that to today, the tables have turned entirely. Back then, Hong Kong was sort of seen as a role model for China by Deng Xiaoping, the paramount leader of the People's Republic of China. And today, of course, it's the complete other way around. We see sort of a mainlandization of Hong Kong, which gives uh, you a sense sort of how much has changed. And I think China always wanted to have that flexibility, sort of see from the day what was in from Hong Kong for the mainland, or whether it could change, uh, turn Hong Kong more uh, into a, like a into being like a mainland Chinese city. And I think that very much characterizes really uh, what has happened over those last 50 years. So after the handover in 97, you could see that Hong Kong tried to uh, keep quite a number of its uh, liberties of, of autonomy rights and, and the Chinese have kept that and, and preserved it for quite a while until more and more protests uh, uh, emerged and also the Chinese felt more and more powerful. And that's when finally in 2020, really the crackdown came uh, and when China imposed a new national security law on Hong Kong basically ending sort of the autonomy and the, and the civil liberties that Hong Kong still enjoyed under Chinese rule. What impact has Hong Kong had on China? An enormous impact. I mean, obviously, as I uh, just said, some people had thought, and including Deng Xiaoping, that China would become similar to Hong Kong over time. That may have not been the case. Um, I mean, the civil liberties that Hong Kong people enjoyed has never sort of come to mainland China, of course. But economically, I think Hong Kong has always been of an enormous importance for mainland China. Go back to the 1950s, uh, during the Korean War, when there was a, a harsh embargo uh, on mainland China, and when Hong Kong as a colony was still used to circumvent uh, that embargo. It was the same during the 60s, that plenty of economic uh, exchanges that Mao's China couldn't have with the Western world, with free market economies, had to go via Hong Kong, either because um, the trade partners and investors were more comfortable or because of political restrictions. Then when Deng Xiaoping started uh, the opening up, the reform and opening up policy in mainland China, it was no surprise that he started to do this with special economic zones. So small cities, back then small cities that develop now into mega cities like Shenzhen, that is sort of the, the uh, Silicon Valley, if you like, of, of China today, that became a special, uh, a special economic zone uh, with uh, uh, preferential conditions in terms of labor laws, in terms of uh, tax breaks, uh, tax incentives, et cetera, et cetera. And they were located very close to Taiwan as well as Hong Kong as free ports, as sort of outposts of the capitalist world that China could easily trade with. So Hong Kong was really once again sort of a gate to the capitalist free market economies. Um, and so it was, again, sort of a bridge for, for China to develop economically. And after, even after the handover, I think Hong Kong became extremely important. First, because the Chinese could learn a lot about uh, a free market that was fully functioning in Hong Kong, about a free convertible currency, for example, you have the Hong Kong dollar, that is so much more liberalized than, for example, uh, the, the renminbi on the mainland. So it was a very, very useful sort of test case to understand uh, firsthand, get firsthand information how free market economies actually work, how capitalist societies work. So in that sense, I think it has been extremely important. And to this day, we have year and year, it, it, it varies a bit, but it's somewhere between 40, 50, 60% of foreign direct investments into mainland China that still come 
through Hong Kong. So it's still a very important uh, a part of China. It's still sort of an extremely important gateway, even though the economic importance for mainland China is shrinking and shrinking. But it has been an extremely important laboratory for the Chinese that has influenced economic reforms that has helped China getting forward uh, with the reform and opening up uh, policy. Interestingly, though, the rule of law regime, the effective uh, legal predictability that you have in Hong Kong, as well as the civil liberty rights from Hong Kong, not to speak of sort of any form of democratic reform, that has not uh, made it through the border, has not made it from Hong Kong, the special administrative region, to the rest of the mainland. So it's a limited effect. It's mainly on economic affairs, but this has been extremely uh, impactful. Do you feel that China has kept promises made to Hong Kong under the Sino-British Joint Declaration? Well, I think importantly, Hong Kong, the, the Sino-British Joint Declaration of Hong Kong is quite vague and broad. That's always what the Chinese wanted. But it also implies that the China should develop a basic law, which it did uh, in, in the late uh, 80s, and that upholding that basic law is also uh, uh, a promise enshrined in the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Now, there's a number of issues that was open to interpretation, and the Chinese uh, interpreted it very much in a way that would serve its own interests. For a long time, China, by and large, was sort of keeping the promises it made in the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Uh, it was even reluctant to enforce some parts of it. Interestingly, what is enshrined in the basic law and in the Sino-British Joint Declaration is that there should be a national security legislation that would be legislated within Hong Kong, but that would take account of the legitimate uh, security interests of mainland China. And the Chinese have accepted for 20 years that that would not be enacted. They have accepted that there was resistance in Hong Kong. So uh, a legal right uh, that was enshrined in legal documents uh, was something that the Chinese were willing to um, let uh, Hong Kong get away with. At the same time, of course, uh, we you could see that the Chinese were starting to um, try and uh, get economically more engaged with, with Hong Kong, trying to get more leverage on Hong Kong, uh, which was not in breach of the Sino-British Joint Declaration, but when more and more resistance to that closer and closer uh, relationship emerged from Hong Kong, it started with, I would say, uh, small infringements here. So for example, there was a case of a, a number of booksellers in Hong Kong that would publish book and sell books, um, that would be sensitive to the, the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. One book that would touch upon President Xi Jinping's sex life that has never appeared, but shortly before it came out, uh, the, the, the editors sort of disappeared uh, from their holiday homes. Now, there's different versions on how this came about, but it's very clear that I think this was a very first, very clear breach uh, of the Central British Joint Declaration. But where it became apparent was in 2020 when the national security law was imposed on, on, on Hong Kong. I mean, as I said before, the Chinese had a right to demand from the Hong Kong parliament to put in place a national security legislation but it had no right that the Beijing leaders would make this. So it drafted an extremely draconian law on Hong Kong that uh, is in violation of quite a number of uh, uh, civil liberties that are enshrined in the sign of British Joint Declaration and the basic law. So I think from 2020 onwards, we have a very grave and very clear breach of the sign of British Joint Declaration. Until then, interestingly, I think the Chinese tried not to openly violate the sino british Joint Declaration. How do Hong Kongers see themselves both at home and on the international stage? And what can the international community learn from Hong Kong's experience? Well, I think this is fascinating to see that many Hong Kong people 
see themselves primarily as Hong Kong or see Hong Kong as an international city and not just necessarily as part of China. And what is so fascinating about it is that the younger the people are, the higher the percentage is that see themselves as Hong Kong people. This is, I think, surprising because those youngsters have been born either uh, shortly before the handover or right after the handover. So they have no active memory of Hong Kong being a British crown colony. They only experienced a time during Hong Kong being a special administrative region to mainland China. And I think the reason for that is for one that economic opportunities in uh, Hong Kong were not as good as they were for their parent generation and their grandparents' uh, generation, but so much also because Hong Kong had reached a certain level of development already and was so exposed to Western culture that the attractiveness of universal values was something they had grown up with, that they were very aware of and that they wanted to enjoy themselves too. And they sort of see that the Chinese influence was growing by the day. And they started to fear very much about the um, their local identity, the, that they could still enjoy the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, and so on and so forth. Those very basic uh, universal values, those basic human rights. And I think this is sort of a fascinating story uh, for us to sort of see that even in an environment that's getting more authoritarian, because the Chinese did tighten their control over Hong Kong, that you could still sort of see even within that sphere a growing uh, sort of support for universal values. What is interesting as well is, of course, how the Chinese reacted to it, because I think it gives us a bit of a sense how China is going to deal with any free society that demands civil liberties that China apparently is sore, Chinese leaders are apparently so afraid of once they have the chance. I mean, let's face it, China is not able to export its authoritarian model around the world without um, any, any hassle. But in Hong Kong, I think, um, since it is a part of China as a special administrative region, China, Chinese leaders were able to push forward and push back against those values. And you could really see how determined uh, the Chinese leaders are to do so, to preserve their own model, to not allow any um, alternative model that could question their way of ruling China. So I think it's a very frightening case where we can actually study what Chinese influence could mean also abroad for uh, in the future once China's power and China's influence grows even more internationally, what that could imply for free societies. In conclusion, we've just seen a new chief executive elected in Hong Kong. Do you feel that this will bring any significant changes? Well, I think it is a consolidation of something that we have seen for quite a while now. There has never been a, a real choice between a pro-democratic candidate and a pro-Beijing candidate. I mean, there have been pro democratic candidates, but with no realistic chance of getting elected to become the chief executive of Hong Kong. But I think this particular election of John Lee, who is going to be the new chief executive, is particular in the sense that he has been the one overseeing the crackdowns of the protests in 2019 against the extradition bill, the last protest that went uh, violent. And I think this is a very clear signal from Beijing to the Hong Kong people, that they will uh, draw a very hard line, that they are very committed to actually enforce the national security law on Hong Kong and to do anything possible, anything in their hands to end the civil liberties that Hong Kong people uh, enjoyed since 1997 when Hong Kong was handed back to China. One recent example for that, I think that doubles down on this, is also the arrest of Cardinal Sen, who has been a, a person who has been supporting the pro-democracy movement for such a long time. 
Sen is an old man. The fact that you arrest a person like him, someone that particularly under those new conditions with the national security law in place, is certainly no threat to sort of the Beijing rulers uh, uh, far away uh, in, in the capital of China, I think really is sort of symbolic to tell everyone we are the ones con fully controlling the city. We can arrest anyone in the city who is dissenting with the views of the rulers in Beijing. And I mean, Cardinal Sen isn't the only one, but he's just the most recent case as of the day that we are recording this uh, of a very prominent figure that has been arrested. And I think John Lee is really a symbolic person to uh, demonstrate that China is going to double down and not backtrack on its crackdown on Hong Kong. So I think this is a very, very unfortunate development. The chief executive elections themselves will not bring enormous change but I think they just demonstrate how committed China actually is. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tim. We truly appreciate your insight into Hong Kong and Hong Kongers' relationship with not only China, but the world. Thank you so much for having me. It was great that I could join today. Thank you, bye. We want to thank our guests, Professor Jeffrey N. Wasserstrom, editor of the Oxford History of Modern China, and Dr. Tim Ruleg, author of China's Foreign Policy Contradictions. We want to thank our guests, Jeffrey M. Wasserstrom, editor of the Oxford History of Modern China, and Dr. Tim Ruleg, author of China's Foreign Policy Contradictions. Both books are now available from OUP. Please check out our show notes on the OUP blog for a recommended reading list exploring just a few of the ideas discussed today. New episodes of the Oxford Comment would premiere on the last Tuesday of each month. Please be sure to follow OUP Academic on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, and YouTube to stay up to date on upcoming podcast episodes. While you're at it, please do subscribe to the Oxford Comment wherever you regularly listen to podcasts, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. Lastly, we want to thank the crew of the Oxford Comment for their assistance on today's episode. Episode 73 was produced by Stephen Filippi, Patrick Horton-Wright, and me, Megan Schaefer. Thank you for listening.